It takes a lot of ingredients to fix or build a car, like cooking, but without the frozen dinner easy way out. eBay Motors has 122 million parts. It's always the right fitment, so you can follow any recipe to a T. Whether it's a vintage Italian coupe that's classic like grandma's meatballs or a German luxury car that's as complicated as Oma's Rouladen, to cook up something great in the garage, use the eBay Motors app or visit ebaymotors.com. Let's ride. Holidays are here, and so is fashionable fitness. Gift yourself a Samsung Galaxy Z Flip 3 5G, a phone that folds in half to literally stand on its own. Pair it with the Galaxy Watch 4 for ultimate wellness and wow factor. Check health stats, flex personal records. Over 90 activities can be tracked, like biking, swimming, golfing, and more. Invest in yourself with tech made to crush goals. Holidays open up with Galaxy. Shop it all at Samsung.com. 5G connection and availability may vary. Check with Carrier. Products sold separately. Hey everyone, this is the Almost World Podcast. Bringing to you mind blowing interviews with guests from all over the world. So settle down, relax, and enjoy the show. Oh yeah, by the way, if you like the podcast, please support Elmo's World Podcast on Patreon. Your support is what helps the podcast improve more and more. Welcome to Elmo's World Podcast. This is Elmo, and I'm with my awesome friend Tyler. Hey man, can you introduce yourself? Sure, yes. Um, my name is Tyler. I uh, teach philosophy at the University of St. Joseph in Macau. Uh, it's the only Catholic uh, university in, in China, as far as I'm aware. Um, I do religious epistemology and philosophy of religion. So uh, I've published a few volumes and uh, lots of journal articles on religious epistemology. Um, specifically, I have one small volume with Cambridge entitled Religious Epistemology. I have a five views book uh, that the audience might be interested in. Uh, debating Christian religious epistemology, and uh, that's with Bloomsbury, and it's co-edited with John DePoe, and we have several authors all debating um, the right sort of epistemology to have. Um, and yeah, other than that, I do philosophy of religion more generally, and um, that's kind of where I uh, special what I specialize in, and and uh, um, where I, I make the money, so to speak. Um, yeah, other than that. Um, I, uh, been married for 12 years and, um, I have, uh, four children born and one child coming. So that, that's about it. Um, so bro, um, have you been raised, I guess, a Christian? Are you a, a convert? Um, can you, and maybe you could tell us like a, a background of how you've arrived at what you believe right now, you know, at being a Christian, and you know maybe you could tell us the milestones of you know your physical uh, philosophical and religious yeah so uh i grew up in a southern baptist home and uh while we didn't go to church every sunday there were seasons where we'd go to church often and uh definitely held the creeds so to speak of the southern baptist tradition um have would have little seasons where i'd read the bible a little bit here and there but I wasn't really faithful, um, at least as faithful as I am now um, to, to my own religious tradition. Um, I uh, ended up going through a series of doubts when I was um, 16, and I sort of entered into an existential crisis of sorts and um, uh, ended up just deciding that I, I didn't know whether or not God existed, whether Christianity was true. And I ended up having a religious experience that um, I sort of found myself believing that Jesus was the Messiah through reading Old Testament passages um, like Isaiah 53 and had this really tangible experience of God in, in my car my senior year of high school. And this uh, led me to be very serious about my Christian commitments, Christian faith, and it's um, uh, when I really got serious about Christianity and ended up going to 
college to um, study biblical studies and uh, went to a bit more of a liberal university where the resurrection wasn't um, uh, made a big deal, whether it was historical or not, and whether certain things actually happened in the Holy Scripture. Uh, and so, yeah, I I ended up having to, to go back to apologetics and kind of put my skeptical hat on so I could entertain objections given for my professors uh, to defend uh, the truth, to defend the faith. And um, so I really got interested in apologetics, um, started street evangelizing really quickly and realized that in order to do good evangelism, you're going to need to know apologetics. You're going to need to know how to defend the faith. So both in my own schooling, my own academic career, the short academic career is what, what it was, and my um, uh, it, through my evangelism, through my ministry, I realized that I needed to know apologetics. And it became clear within a year or so that philosophy really was the way to go if you're trying to get heavy into apologetics. And so um, ended up getting into to philosophy through through that avenue so in, in this way like through philosophy you've arrived i guess you know at, at and using it to find out the truth you've arrived at your belief system right now uh so i, I wouldn't say i arrived at my belief system through philosophy um i uh like i said i, I came to f- to become serious about my faith, to really take hold of my faith, to to sort of leave a more agnostic state to a sincere, faithful Christian um, state, uh, because I had a religious experience primarily. Um, it, it was afterwards, though, that upon having the experience and and coming to believe that Christianity is true, and I need to take it seriously. Um, that I got into philosophy and apologetics and, um, that was kind of more of my avenue to, uh, do outreach and to evangelize. And so it was, it was coming to, to know basic philosophy and, and basic apologetics that enabled me to do what I felt, um, God was calling me to do. So it wasn't so much I, I came to arguments first. I, I came to various evidences and so forth outside of Old Testament scripture, which I found myself believing Jesus was the Messiah. Outside of that, the, all the apologetics and um, philosophical arguments of that, that came later. Well, you're someone who's into religious epistemology, right? And um, I, I'm really curious, like how some someone who's uh, specialized in this would look and like analyze or ev- ev- evaluate, I guess, the religious experience that you've had when you started Christianity. Like for, um, for example, uh, it's a religious experience. So it's something that you, that you came, uh, you, you know, you, you came to know about. I guess, in a way as well. So how would you sort of qualify that and say that it's not just some hallucination of some or some psychological trick we humans do, you know, to make us feel better about ourselves or something like um, a normal objectionist would do about this? Yeah. Um, so I just kind of speak about how I would analyze my situation now as a philosopher. That That's the idea? Yeah. So... Um, Alvin Plantinga uh, is a well-known epistemologist, I think one of the most important epistemologists in the 20th century. And uh, in 2000, that's the beginning of the 21st century, he had a work called Warranted Christian Belief. And I think it was really paradigm shifting um, uh, that in his previous work um, from the late 60s, uh, God and Other Minds, up until then, he was really paradigm shifting the field of religious epistemology, where typically a lot of people argued that it was kind of assumed that if you're going to be rational, right, if you're going to have a rational belief, you need arguments, you need evidence. And Plantinga comes along and says, no, no, not, that's not the case. You know, what if, for example, um, John Calvin 
is is right. John Calvin is institutes, I believe book one talks about how we have a sense of the divine sense of divinity, what he calls a uh, census divinitatis. And what if this census divinitatis is sort of like a faculty that allows us to become aware of God and his activities and Plenigo says, let's let's assume that it's functioning properly and aimed at truth. You know, it's aimed at producing true beliefs. Well, then our belief about God and his activities could be rational or warranted, even if we didn't have any arguments. So take, for example, um, a sort of a more uh, mundane belief. Let's say the belief in other minds. So uh, whenever I go and teach uh, my classes that I teach, you know, I walk in the door and uh, I, I open the door and I, I walk in and, and I see students and I form the belief that there are other people in the room. Now, let's say that um, um, my belief was formed because I have a cognitive faculty or faculties that are sort of hardwired in me to enable me to become aware that there are other people in the room and what they're doing and so on. Now, let's say that my faculties are functioning properly and they're successfully aimed at truth. Well, then it seems like I'd be rational and that I can know that there are other people in the room whenever I encounter other people in the room. And so I'm sort of like hardwired to believe it. Well, in the same way, perhaps we are, it's, it seems possible um, Plenigus says, as far as we know, it could be the case um, that we have a faculty aimed at producing belief about God, his activities, and assuming that it's functioning properly, named it truth, then our beliefs about God, his activities could be warranted. They, they, they'd be rational. And so Plen Plenigus comes up with um, this sort of approach, this argument against this evidentialist uh, approach to religious belief and says, no, well, that's not necessary, right? As, as, there could be um, factors external to our, our access to what we're, um, what, what we have um, uh, external to the arguments that we have, right? Um, that could warrant our beliefs. And so that, that's, that's kind of when I look back at my own situation, um, I see myself, uh, I think that's kind of something what happened where I, I think that the spirit was moving in me and was testifying to me that Jesus was the Messiah as I was reading Old Testament scripture and uh, assuming that my facts were functioning properly and I was accepting the spirit's testimony, um, then, you know, my belief that Jesus is the Messiah as could be warranted um, apart from argumentation. And then afterwards, when I felt God's presence and when I, when I, I was, as I stated, was in my car and it felt like God was, um, tangible to me, you know, if, if I have faculties responsible for perceiving God, for being, coming aware of God's presence and my faculties were functioning properly and aimed at truth and my belief that I was perceiving God or experiencing God would be warranted. Uh, even if I lacked good arguments for thinking that I, indeed I was perceiving God and instead of, you know, perceiving something else. So, yeah, that, that, that's kind of how I view my own religious experience in light of the sort of epistemology that I endorse. What, what, you, what you mean by that? You can sort of compare, you know, your, your reliance on your cognitive faculties um there that there are simply there are things that we are that beliefs that are properly basic as alvin plantinga said and that the census divinitatis is something of a properly basic thing too right that to us humans as well and, and that you know when you had that religious experience you just sort of couldn't deny it and it was it, it seemed self-evident to you yeah so um i would say that um that so the uh, you mentioned basic beliefs right um so in in epistemology right someone could always ask you um well how do you know that right 
and you could give them a reason why you think something's the case. And then they could ask you again, well, how do you know that? Right. And then you have to give them another reason. And it, the idea is that eventually it's going to um, break down to, to some sort of fundamental belief. Right. And it's the, the, and this belief isn't based on other beliefs. It's not based off of other arguments. Right. And so given that it's not based on other arguments, we can call these properly basic beliefs, right? If it's held proper, if it's held rightly, uh, if it's held appropriately, and there's no other arguments that the belief is based on, we can call this a properly basic belief. And uh, we can call those beliefs that are based or rest upon these properly basic beliefs, we can call them based beliefs. And so, yeah, the idea here is that God, belief that God exists, or the belief that God was in my car with me that one day, or the belief that um, Jesus is the Messiah of the Old Testament, um, you know, the, these would be properly basic beliefs. Um, they're, they're beliefs that are warranted, um, but are beliefs, and they're, they're beliefs that are rational, beliefs that are justified, but there are beliefs that are held apart from argumentation. So I don't base, it's not like I utilize arguments and then come to these beliefs, um, but rather these beliefs are sort of formed in me uh, in an immediate way and, uh, and um, they're, they're appropriately held or whatnot. So yeah, that, that's, that's how I would sketch it up. For example, so your belief that Jesus is the Messiah is like, you, it's the same le at, at the same level of, of saying that um, that there are other minds, right? Or or like in a, or okay, but how do you then dis differentiate? Like okay, like th then I could also say like my I have my my belief in a in a giant octopus in outer space is is also a warranted belief. You know how do you differentiate that? Differentiate that because it's like you're put making these beliefs unfalsifiable, and it, and how do you separate it from just basic imagination? So, uh, yeah, I think that's that's an important question that a lot of people want, want to try to make sure they address in the literature. Um, there's uh, one art, one version of it uh, inspired by um, the comic strip and cartoon um, Peanuts all right, with Snoopy. All right, it's called the Great Pumpkin Objection. And uh, how do we know that, you know, Linus actually wasn't warranted in his belief that the Great Pumpkin would come on Halloween uh, this great pumpkin sort of entity, monster being, I don't know, whatever you want to call him, uh, comes and visits, you know, all the pumpkin patches on Halloween. How do you know that Linus' belief wasn't warranted, even though it seems absurd that it could be, right? And in your case, you give a case of a giant octopus in space. Right, okay. So um, there's a few things we can say to this. First, it is important to recognize that uh, Implantiga's uh, sort of initial glossing of, of this, he would make the claim that if Christianity is true, then it's probably warranted. Why is that? Or if theism is true, it's probably warranted. Why is that? Well, because, you know, you have a, a good god who wants to know us and wants to love us and so is, and is all powerful so he can create in us a faculty that can give us knowledge about him so he, he's the one responsible for our creation for the, giving us faculties for uh he's and it's out of love that he's working in such a way that he produces in us a way that we can know him so i mean is the great pumpkin or is the octopus in space, you know, an analogous situation? Are they responsible for our faculties or at least partly responsible for our faculties? Is it out of love in which on this hypothesis, right, um, uh, that, that they would uh, be motivated and have the power to, to create us um, and to give us these faculties so we can know them in a basic way? Um, if you say yes, then... Maybe you're, what you're describing is God. It's just your God has a vested interest in pumpkins or, you know, your God is um, for some reason takes the form of an octopus, right? So that is one sort of consideration um, 
uh, that that I think that that, that we should um, have. Um, you know, it's kind of like William Lane Craig was debating. Um, I can't remember who it was. Maybe it was like Peter Atkins or something. And uh, he was giving a hypothesis about a computer. <laughs> he said, how do you know what a computer didn't make us? And it's a really strong computer and a really knowledgeable computer and a computer that loves everyone and computer. And then Craig, you know, at the end of the and a computer that's immaterial. <laughs> and Craig at the end of the day is like, well, you know, well, you just described God basically, right? Um, and so um, that's kind of this same way that Plantinga has taken this sort of objection. But um, I've spent with Eric Baldwin uh, a lot of time arguing that um, that a lot of religious traditions can't actually make the same claims that Plantinga makes with Christianity. So we argue along with Plantinga, and we try to to further his arguments that you really can't make sense of proper function and design plans, right? If you don't have a designer of our cognitive faculties. So a lot of Eastern traditions that lack something like a personal being um, who's responsible for the design of our faculties, um, well, they're just not going to be able to to provide the resources to make intelligible what it means to have properly functioning faculties. Um, Islam has, uh, maybe it can account for Plantinga's proper functionalism, um, though it's going to have some trouble as well. Uh, we talk about this in a paper as well as in our book, um, Plantinga in Religious Epistemology and Moral Religions, where um, you, you have this concern about if our faculties are really ambit truth, given that um, Allah in Surah 8, for example, deceives Muhammad and his um, army for a good reason, uh, but nonetheless deceives him and then boasts elsewhere, a handful of places elsewhere, that he's the greatest deceiver. No one uh, deceives better than him, something like that. So you might get you might think this is like an analogous situation to being hit by a laser beam. Uh, maybe you're you have a general and the general hits you with a laser beam and the laser beam makes you think that um, that reinforcements are coming, so to speak. Uh, and the the gun the the um, general will hit you with this laser beam whenever he sees fit. And uh, whenever you're hit with um, the laser beam on the field, you don't, you don't know it. But then after the battle, the general comes up to you and says, Hey, I hit you with this laser beam can make you believe false things such as reinforcements are coming. Um, and then you think, okay, well, hopefully he hasn't used that on me like outside of the field. Right. But then you see him outside of the field um, boasting that no one uses this gun better than he does. And he's the best user of this nefarious technology. Uh, well, in that case, maybe you're going to start to question whether you're not just like globally deceived right now. Um, so maybe, maybe Islam might have a harder time with accounting for truth aimed faculties. Also, within the Islamic tradition, largely at least in its tradition, um, it set out a requirement that we need to test the, um, you know, as part of the Quran, it's just, you know, test test the, the the Quran, see if it's true sort of thing. And there's this idea, this sort of meta level requirement in Islam that you need in order to have robust knowledge. And uh, we're going to have doubts. We're designed to have doubts. And in order to, to truly put away those doubts and have robust knowledge, we need to have access um, to, to arguments and so on. Uh, so maybe you think that within the faithful Islamic tradition, you won't actually be able to make the same claims that Plantinga makes. All this to say, it's not obvious that anyone, for whatever reason, cannot just make a claim that um, their religious belief is, is, can be warranted apart from argumentation. Um, and then finally, let's go ahead and let's, let's go ahead for, for argument's sake and assume that, um, that two people have the resources, right? Their worldviews have the resources to make sense of proper functionalism 
and can both consistently say, um, my religious belief, it's absolutely possible that it's, it's warranted, um, apart from argumentation. That doesn't mean, and, and let's say that these two, two different individuals and their two different worldviews are in conflict, right? They're not consistent. That doesn't mean that all of a sudden that just because someone else can make claim to having a warranted belief and can account for their belief being warranted, that doesn't mean that all of a sudden both people need to suspend their beliefs, right? Um, you know, Plantinga makes this point where he, he talks about um, how, you know, maybe you, you, you and I are, are co-workers and I think it's okay to lie about my colleagues in order to advance my career and you don't. Um, well, uh, let's say we argue about it and we share our, our arguments with each other. We were epistemic peers. We're roughly of the same intelligence, et cetera. And let's say at the end of the day, we just disagree. Well, does this disagreement amount to defeat? Like just because we disagree, does that mean we now need to be agnostic on whether or not it's permissible to lie about a colleague uh, in order to advance your career? Um, no. No, that, that, that doesn't seem right. So now let's, you know, make it more pertinent. Let's say both of us can say, well, hey, I can be warranted in my ethical belief if it's the product of properly functioning faculties. Um, and uh, you say the same. Well, just because you can make that claim, does that all of a sudden make us such that we need to become agnostic about whether or not it's permissible to lie about a colleague? No, that doesn't seem like the case either. Uh, in fact, this whole idea that we need to suspend belief, um, we need to become agnostics uh, based off of there being peer disagreement, genuine peer disagreement. So a peer being, you know, again, we're of the same intellectual, uh, we have the same intellectual capabilities. Um, we, uh, we know all the arguments, right? We're... Uh, that, that are relevant to whatever we're arguing about. Um, and uh, 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 yeah, so we're epistemic peers and we're of the same intellectual capabilities and yet we're, we're disagreeing. Does that mean we both need to remain agnostic? No, take this for example, you know, this belief that we need to be agnostic on uh, all those topics where there's genuine peer disagreement. Well, that's a topic where there's genuine peer disagreement. I can disagree with you that we need that we don't need to remain agnostic on um, matters where there's genuine peer disagreement. So that would mean we need to be agnostic on that. So long story short, yeah, I don't find the, these sorts of objections to be um, too too devastating or too problematic. Yeah. I, okay. You've covered a lot. You've covered a lot of uh, topics there, bro. And um, let me sort of guess break down that break them down a bit. Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, so you start. I guess you started with like um, you know, I ask you the question: Is your belief in in Christianity or Jesus being the Messiah or that God is real like a, a warranted belief? You know, and then you and then you sort of. Bre I guess broke it down with the and uh, with the my ob with the, my objection, you know, uh, with the great pumpkin pumpkin objection, and the pumpkin objection is, I I'd say that you know the 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 real problem with that the pumpkin objection is that anyone it, that anyone can actually make a warranted belief if the, if the standard you set. Is is basically just you know if you anyone that attempts to make a rational justification for their belief, right? But you know, for example, like um, it, the belief in other minds, you know, we we say that it is properly basic because you know we 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 can't really prove it, but we just sort of grant it as that. But you know what? When you attempted to to say that Christianity. If Christianity is true, it's probably warranted. You went a lot, uh, you through a lot of arguments there, especially by establishing that Christianity has to be true first. So, is it really is is it really warranted to say that Jesus is is uh, is it really a warranted belief to say that Jesus is the Messiah if you have to prove 
first that Christianity is true and have to dismantle every other religion uh, like like Islam and and all the other uh I guess uh forms of monotheism in that case and yeah uh also you sort of assume, I guess go, went to the argument of intelligent design also in order to prove that theism was is true so it is not it doesn't really appear like a warranted belief if you have to go through this tedious process right to actually prove it to be a warranted belief so i, th- I think um maybe what you have in mind is that it wouldn't be a basic belief right um uh, not that it would be a warranted belief but um yeah so uh, thanks for asking those questions uh no it would still be a basic belief because i'm not arguing right now in order to get to the conclusion that Christian belief is warranted, right? So I'm not giving arguments to show that it is. Right now, I'm giving arguments to show that, um, to, to defend Plantinga's um, uh, proper functionalist theory and reformed epistemology. So I'm, I'm giving arguments that respond to certain objections uh, uh, that, that you've raised, or at least that you've alluded to. So that would be different than saying that I have to show that Christianity is true uh, in order to have warranted belief. So I've never said that. I've never made that claim. Um, Perhaps you have in mind a certain time where maybe you think I said it or um, something like that. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, you said that if Christianity is true, it's probably warranted. Right, but I don't have to know that. Christ- you know that a good a good God who wants to know us, who wants to know, to love us, who loves us, giving uh, give, gave us these faculties, to, to, you know, to cognitive uh, faculties to understand and everything. Right, but I don't I don't think we have to know that Christianity is true. So it's it's kind of like um, going back to the other minds example. I don't have to know that my faculties are aimed at truth and are designed to produce belief in other minds in order for um, my belief about other minds to be warranted or take a a dog, right? Or a young child. Um, The dog or the child doesn't have to, they they, they obviously don't (laughs) know that, that they have faculties that are aimed at truth and that are functioning properly, right? Nonetheless, they still know stuff. You know, the dog knows that there's food in front of them, or the child knows um, uh, that um, that uh, you know there's an object that is not disappearing even when it goes out of their sight, right? Um, so uh, animals and and young children know stuff, but they don't know that they know or they don't know that their beliefs are justified or, you know, they don't have conceptual resources, obviously, to well, analyze. Yeah, but I'm, I'm sort of seeing two levels of knowledge here. There, there's a knowledge that you know this to be true, and there's but there's a knowledge that you just believe it to be true, right? For example, if, uh, you you know, our, our knowledge that there are other minds is just something that we have to believe to be true, but we actually don't actually know to be true because if you if you really know it, then you have like full proper like justification for that belief, right? But no one really can prove that there are other minds. I, I think that's what you're sort of are getting at. Is that it? Well, so I think that would be to beg the question, right? To say that in order to know something, you have to... Um, be able to prove it or to be able to show all the reasons why that's likely the case or is the case, right? That's to sort of assume um, this sort of evidence. Yeah, but I guess, yeah, I, I guess that's why um, Alvin Plantinga uses the, the term belief rather than properly basic, like knowledge, you know? If he says it's knowledge, then you really know it to be the objective fact. But if you if it's like a properly basic belief, then you it's something you have to just grant you know it's just a belief so in a way you're justified to believe it but it doesn't mean that what you believe is actually true a belief is just like a affirming a proposition we can say that for for our purposes here and so uh knowledge for plenty would be a warranted true belief 
So it, it would be a belief still, uh, if you're affirming a proposition, and the belief corresponds with reality, so it's true, right? Or the proposition corresponds with reality, right? And the proposition in question obviously is affirmed, right? Um, and it's it's warranted. So it's it's uh, it's a belief because it's affirmed. The proposition it corresponds with reality, and it's warranted, right? And it's warranted only if it's produced from properly functioning faculties aimed at truth, et cetera. So Plantinga thinks that we can have knowledge that Christianity is true in a basic way or that God exists in a basic way. And uh, he, he doesn't think, however, that we have to know that, um, that the conditions are in place in order to, so in the beginning of War and Proper Function, that's 1993 volume, he makes this clear that he doesn't think that you have to know that the conditions are in place in order to have warranted belief um, and you have warranted belief because these conditions are in place, just like a dog, a dog has knowledge. An infant has knowledge. A young child has knowledge. Um, you know, the dog knows where there's food. Uh, you know, if I come home and bring fast food home and the, the dog knows that, that I have food in my hand. Right. Um, uh, so they have knowledge. But it, it's it's not knowledge that um, is arrived at by way of abduction or deduction or induction. It's it's knowledge that's um, that, that that's achieved by way of having properly merely by having properly functioning faculties aimed at truth. Is that does that make sense? Okay, so can you tell me how a dog sort of has the arrived at the knowledge that there is food with just the properly functioning? Yeah, thing? so if their faculties are designed um, to produce the belief that there's something right there, um, and their faculties are functioning properly. And what faculties of a dog? Like seeing? Oh, I'm sure part of it would be like perceptual faculties. Okay, so he, in a way, he he arrived at the food, like, knowledge of the food empirically, like he saw it and he smelled it. Right. So perception is a is a, a faculty. So in a way, it's like an intuitional knowledge. This uh, properly basic belief thing. Um. Yeah, that could be part of the process. Is having um a, an intuition. It seems to you to to be the case it seems to the dog that there's something in front of him right that the ball is right there so would you say that your like your religious experience is something that's also that came to you in a in an intuitional way yeah so uh, it depends on what you mean by intuitional but yeah i mean if if it's like if uh if you're just talking about if my um if my you know, it just seems to me to be the case that God exists or just seems to me to be the case that Jesus is the Messiah, right? And it, that's not based off of arguments. It's just, it just seems that way to me. And that seeming is the product of properly functioning faculties. Then, yeah, that, then that, that's, that's how my belief would primarily be warranted. So, okay. So in a way, it seems to you that Jesus is the Messiah. It seems to you that God is real. And so how did you arrive at this seemingness? Like what data did you an have to analyze and take in and have to consider in order to, to arrive at this seeming conclusion? Yeah, so I, I don't think that you have to, I don't think that I took data in and went through it and figured out what was the best explanation of the data. Uh, I, if I did, then, uh, then the beliefs wouldn't, wouldn't be basic, right? Oh, all right. It's, uh, wait, I'm, I'm, I'm confused. I'm sorry. I apologize. Okay, so, uh, okay. Let, let let's say that I'm I'm this human being. You know, I, I'm just a tabula rasa. I don't know anything, and then I just wake up, right? And and th if I'm just closing in my eyes, there's nothing. Like I not I'm not feeling anything. I'm just a. Uh, I'm not feeling anything. I'm just not thinking. I'm not doing anything, and there, I'm not taking any data. There's no external stimuli. Would you say that I would still be able to? But I'm. I can think, you know, logically, rationally, and I, my cognitive faculties are all right. But there's no external stimuli, so would I be able to still uh, ar arrive intuitionally to say that there seems to be a God and Jesus is the Messiah in that sense, with no, with no data whatsoever? Um, 
Well, so I guess, I mean, can I imagine a scenario where um, God just magically um, sort of produces in you a belief or um, God... Maybe you can do that, actually, yeah. Inputs, inputs into you. Uh, okay, are we talking like then like a revel revelatory type of knowledge then like speak you can consider it so uh and um Kevin Diller's volume um where he takes on Bart and Plantica's thought together um I think that's actually one of the strategies that he does in trying to synthesize the two thinkers is that he considers um what Plantica is doing to be revel revelatory knowledge so um it depends on how you want to define everything but um, yeah, that, that's a possibility. I could see someone trying to define that in that way. Uh, would you um, say that that that's what your religious experience is? It's that your knowledge or your your the seeming seemingness belief in that Jesus is the Messiah and that God is real is a revelatory type of knowledge. Would you say that is what you, what you? I guess it just depends on what one means by that. So if one just means it's revelatory in the sense that there's an outside source coming in. And um, the, the divine outside source is coming in and is um, guiding me to truth or is informing me about. Uh, so, for example, when you read Holy Scripture, that's a it's testimony by, written by men and by God, um, by both. And let's say the Spirit's also moving me to accept this testimony uh, that he's written. Um, then, then, yeah, that seems that seems to be a um, I'm coming to, to believe based off of um revelation and it's 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 a re revelatory um process so to speak so when it so if this not like religious experience that you've had you know you arrived at your belief in god and that jesus the messiah is, is, a, is a revelation maybe you know from the holy spirit working in you and all of that yeah um how do you falsify it though like can you prove to yourself that it is or is it something that you just know to be true because it, it. Um, well, you can still falsify it. I mean, if if you you can develop defeaters for beliefs that are basic. Um, so, for example, I was talking to you, and um, all of a sudden, I believe that I was talking to a person named Elmo. But then, um, someone came into the room and pushed a, pushed a button on you that I didn't see, and all of a sudden, your head like went down, and your head opened up, and instead of being a brain, I just saw a whole bunch of um, that, uh, wires and, um, you know, gears and stuff, uh, then I would have a defeater that I'm talking to a person, right? Uh, in the same way, there might be defeaters for Christianity. Um, if you can show that, you know, Jesus's body's still over here, right? Um, that would be one way. Um, maybe you can show that inherently there's a, a contradiction that shouldn't be seen as an apparent contradiction, but a genuine contradiction. Um, but in, in the Christian faith, that, that, that would be another way. So you can still formulate defeaters, uh, even though the belief, uh, is in a way. So, um, but here's what I've got from that, from what you said though, right? Like if let's say that, and you, I think you believe that the religious experience that you've had, you know, which is a, rev let's say it's a revelation from, from a divine source outside of you. Right, and this knowledge that God is real and Jesus is the Messiah, then but you 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 believe this to be true, but you also consider the possibility that it could be wrong, right? Because if if if, if uh, more information it, like comes about that that Jesus is yeah is like is is actually uh, f false or or all, all of that stuff, so is it that's how you falsify it then? Okay, can you repeat the how you falsify it part? How you falsify it is by by the by considering other, I guess like by the by the arrival of information that could actually be defeaters. Right. So I, I you you give me an objection, I reflect on it, and I consider it a worthy objection or not. And if I do consider it a worthy objection, I'll consider it more. And if I realize that actually you're right and I'm wrong, then yeah, that that that's 
gonna so so this is interesting though then right like so it's in, in that case that um your belief that god is real and that jesus is the messiah can actually be affected by the arrival of inform of information you know for in your thinking and your thought process right so let so let's say that okay so um you believe that jesus is messiah based on revelation but then someone talk uh, comes up to you and say hey look bro this is the like historical evidence that shows that it's not It's not it's G, the the historical accuracy of G, of the gospels and and of Jesus's uh, uh, resurrection is not really strong enough to prove that it, it's actually true uh, real. So in a way, uh, there's there's a, a a big chance that Jesus was not resurrected and it was just all uh, uh, illusion and and everything. So it could in a way it could actually disprove your 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 basic belief i guess um so uh if you give me an objection and it decreases my psychological confidence my psychological certainty to a sufficient degree where i no longer um have a strong enough belief to where my belief is considered warranted then then your objection would have defeated um my 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 belief yeah is, yeah is if warm. i guess if right right and so um no yeah you again going back to the case of um you're actually a, a machine <laughs> you're a west world robot um uh yeah it, it, i i would immediate form the immediate belief that you're a person but then someone would show me all your gears and tell me how uh, all this information and this new information I'd think about and I would go, oh, okay, I guess, you know, is this an elaborate trick <laughs> or is this real? And I'd come to my own conclusions. And if I came to the conclusion that it was real, then it would defeat my initial immediate belief, my basic belief. So just because you have basic beliefs doesn't mean they're not immune to defeat. So my question, next question would come, would come towards like, um, what, then you know when you you know when when you said right that the there are there the immu- that there is not your basic beliefs aren't actually immune to defeaters right and and so the you have to i guess also consider all the data like um is god really real and and will will all the arguments against god's existence or for god's existence strengthen your conf- psychological confidence or lessen it have have you like how have you you know looked at all the arguments and t- told yourself that um it is the fact that god exists and it's it, every all the arguments confirm my basic belief that god exists Right. So um, you're, you're, even though belief is, a firm, is, um, is basic, your warrant for that belief can increase um, by way of arguments. And so um, I think that's the case where I find myself naturally believing in God or that Jesus isn't laying in a tomb somewhere, but that various arguments for God, say certain Thomistic arguments, some of Swinburne's inductive arguments for God. Um, this inc- increases my warrant for thinking that God exists or that Christianity is true. Um, obviously, if I thought that there were no good arguments, then maybe my warrant wouldn't be affected one way or the other. Um, or obviously, if I thought that there were good arguments for atheism and no good arguments for theism, well, then that might affect you know, my, my belief Uh, in a negative way okay but uh, my, my next question is um like okay so you're considering all these you know thomistic uh, arguments and other arguments for god but would you say that they those arguments are actually like can actually prove 100 that god exists r- like rationally no i mean i think there's always going to be an out usually generally to arguments um and i, I don't I, i'm not a big fan of talking about absolute certainty Um, so no, I don't, I don't think that that's the case, but nonetheless, I think that they can be good enough to give confidence boosters, so to speak. In a way, in a way, it's like, um, they're sort of supplement your belief in, that God exists. And, and I, I do think if you have a 
soft version of what it means to prove, right? So not like gives you a hundred percent epistemic certainty. <laughs> maybe maybe you have like what something like a, the principle of sufficient reason. Well, I, I was gonna say if if you if you just define prove to be like it gives you personally uh, psychological certainty, right? That God exists. If that's what you mean by prove, then yeah, I think that the, some of these arguments can prove that, that God exists. But if what you're asking for is like an impossibility of the contrary sort of um, uh, prove, right? Then, then yeah, then I don't think that's the case. Well, um, you know, we, we're uh, at 10 minutes uh, for, for the last 10 minutes of the episode. Can, can I ask you uh, one last question, bro? And maybe you could... Uh... Uh, yeah, it's been awesome talking to you, man. Like, I'm really interested in, uh, in all this uh, really epistemology and how you arrived at this, um, you know, religious experience and how you, it, uh, yeah. So my, my, my last question is, um, being a Christian, you know, you're someone that, that is into the, the, not, the, the, the affirming that and our religious experience could actually be some, something that could actually be true right like you know if i feel that the holy spirit is working in me and sort of revealed that the knowledge that christ is the messiah and that god is real but you know there are so many people that that could say that oh no that's just a psychological thing you know you're you you just indoctrinated into it and that's why you sort of you know made it into your mind and puzzled it in and just in a way you you sort of elude fooled yourself into this but how would but you know as an up in a an epistemologist like you how would you affirm someone that hey you know you're you're experiencing this and they can't prove to you that you didn't experience this, experience this, but. So I think this goes back to some of the conversation we had earlier where uh, I talked about, for example, um, the dog doesn't have to know that she knows in order to know, right? Or she doesn't have to know that she's justified in order to, to know, right? Um, as long as the dog is designed to produce belief that P and P is the product of properly functioning faculties. That's all that matters at the end of the day. In a similar way, I don't have to show you that my religious experience is genuine, that it does correspond with reality. I don't have to show you that's the best explanation of it or uh, that it, um, based off of inductive inferences, you know, it's, it's, um, it's the, the right way to go, so to speak. Uh, as long as my religious experience is moving me to produce belief that God exists and my belief is the result of properly functioning faculties, that's all that matters. So uh, a lot of the objections that, um, that I think that you are getting at, hinting at, or raising explicitly um, assumed this idea that, that uh, it's called KK thesis. And it, it's in order to know you have to in order to know you have to know you know right, uh, and it seems like you were either endorsing KK thesis or some thesis not too far off, and um, and and so the the proper functionalist is just going to reject that and just say nope, I don't. At the end of the day, I have to know that I know. I don't have to know that I'm justified. I don't have to know that I'm warranted. Um, as long as those conditions are in place. Just like what they're in place with the dog or with the young child, um, that's all that matters at the end of the day. I don't have to show you in any way, shape, or form that my that the conditions are likely in place. By the way, um, one last question that I, I need to uh, ask this: um, you know, the KK thesis, right? Um, you talked about like, do I do I have to know that I know? Well, you know, as a human society and, you know, someone who I myself am very skeptical and, you know, I and and use skepticism in a way to filter out beliefs and, and ideas, you know, truths that 
in order to arrive at the ultimate truth, right? That's what philosophy is all about. You know, we're asking questions. But if you're just gonna, if you, if someone is gonna say that, hey, you know, I don't have to know that I know, then isn't that something so sort of like an ignorance is bliss thing that you know this is how it appears to me and I'm just gonna accept it. You know, I'm not gonna question it any any longer. You know, it, doesn't it seem that way? Well, you can question or be open to objections um or defeaters for your belief but no i mean as, as assuming that you don't want to jettison animal knowledge or that young children have knowledge then i think um you're i think there's perfectly good reason to think that that's not necessary in order to know okay well what if i do de- jettison like children animal knowledge and say that they're just you know right so young children don't have knowledge animals don't have knowledge i, th- I think that's sort of a reductio to your position uh, because i think it's really obvious that young children and animals have knowledge and so if your epistemic theory um is inconsistent with animals and young children having knowledge then that shows to me that your epistemic theory reaches an absurd conclusion can you show me if how it's inconsistent? Okay, let let, let me try. It. Um, I'd say like, look, okay, um, an animal or a child, they're 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 using their cognitive faculties to estimate using the data in front of them with their you know fa- pr- like fa- faculties, you know, functioning faculties. So when they suppose that this th- something to be to th- when they supposed to have knowledge of something is just an estimation and, b- and based on the accuracy of and everything, but they sometimes they could actually be fooled. You know, they an animal or a child they could actually have knowledge of something, it, it, and it actually is false and it's not true. So in this sense, it's not really knowledge. It's just it's just a uh, it's a calculation based on, on data. Well, all, all our beliefs could be false too, but it doesn't mean we don't know anything. So just just because um, the the um, proposition that's affirmed could actually be false, that doesn't knowledge the potential for mm-hmm. the proposition to help constitute mm-hmm. knowledge. So in a way, then um, um, I, what I'm seeing is that what is what does it, it mean to know? something does it have to be true knowledge it has to be true yeah it has to be true warranted true belief i think it's a good definition yeah so warranted true belief would be knowledge and so again it, it's true if it corresponds with reality it's a belief if you affirm the proposition in question and uh the belief would be warranted um if it's the product of properly functioning faculties aimed at truth and so that's how beliefs get that nice property. So if they get that nice epistemic property, um, then then the then we should say that you know this proposition. It could be said that you know this proposition. And one other thing um, I wanted to mention, I don't think that um, animals and young infants are just kind of like getting data and then are doing like inference to the best explanation or subconsciously like, you know, doing Bayes' theorem to get to some conclusion. Uh, I think their beliefs are uh, basic. So I, I think that they have a certain experience and the experience moves their faculties in such a way as to produce a belief in response to the stimuli. So um, I did want to clear that up as well. All right, then I guess uh, we, we don't have time anymore, bro. And, you know, it's been awesome talking to you. Maybe we could uh, uh, have talk about this in another episode. Thank you, uh, Tyler. Thank you so much for your time. It's been awesome, man. I really, really love this. All right. Well, good, good. And uh, thanks for inviting me. And I hope you have a wonderful day. So that's the end of it. Thanks for tuning in, guys. This is your host, Elmo Ador Jr. And thank you for listening in. And please subscribe. Please follow us on Facebook. Please, please follow this. Please. Thanks. It used to be hard to find the exact auto parts you needed, and that meant spending a lot of time at swap meets. It's a different game now when you can order exactly what you need from eBay Motors. They have 122 million parts, so you can always find the right fitment. Spend less time searching and more time building with the eBay Motors app or visit ebaymotors.com. Let's ride. 
Holidays are here, and so is fashionable fitness. Gift yourself a Samsung Galaxy Z Flip 3 5G, a phone that folds in half to literally stand on its own. Pair it with the Galaxy Watch 4 for ultimate wellness and wow factor. Check health stats, flex personal records. Over 90 activities can be tracked, like biking, swimming, golfing, and more. Invest in yourself with tech made to crush goals. Holidays open up with Galaxy. Shop it all at Samsung.com. 5G connection and availability may vary. Check with Carrier. Products sold separately.